guest today is Yejin Choi. Yejin received her PhD from Cornell and is currently professor at the University of Washington, as well as senior research director at the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Yejin is one of the world-leading researchers in natural language processing and, more generally, artificial intelligence. Her research has won many awards, including at NACL, ACL, ICML, NIRIPS, AAAI, ICCV, that is pretty much at all the leading AI research conferences, she's won awards. She's been featured in the New York Times, in the New Yorker. She spoke at the main TED stage just recently. She won the Genius Award, officially known as the MacArthur Fellowship. Yejin, so great to have you here with us. Welcome to the show. Yeah, um, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So glad to have you here. But before diving into our conversation, I'd like to thank our podcast sponsors, Index Ventures and Weights and Biases. Index Ventures is a venture capital firm that invests in exceptional entrepreneurs across all stages, from seed to IPO. With offices in San Francisco, New York, and London, the firm backs founders across a variety of verticals, including AI, SaaS, fintech, security, gaming, and consumer. On a personal note, Index is an investor in Covariant, and I couldn't recommend them any higher. Weights and Biases is an ML ops platform that helps you train better models faster with experiment tracking, model and dataset versioning, and model management. They are used by OpenAI, NVIDIA, and almost every lab releasing a large model. In fact, probably all of my students at Berkeley and colleagues at Covariant are big users of weights and biases. Yejin, welcome. So let's dive right in. Large language models like GPT-4 and ChatGPT have taken the world by storm. It seems that since the release of ChatGPT just a few months ago, the whole world has taken notice that AI is becoming extremely capable. As a world-leading natural language processing and AI researcher, you are personally at the frontier of all of this. And in fact, while there has been inordinate progress, you've also been identifying remaining limitations. Can you maybe tell us what exactly is going on with these models? And from there, what are examples of remaining limitations? Yeah, so um, large language models turns out to be a um, really, really powerful tool to generalize a lot of uh, language-based reasoning problems, <clears throat> understanding problems, and uh, a variety of generation problems, all using the same uh, one unified model based on transformers, of course, um, trained on really a lot of internet data. And it turns out it can really learn um, uh, amazing patterns of language as well as reasoning uh, such that it can enable just phenomenal uh, uh, empirical results. Super exciting time. Um, but what's exciting to me is also that um, it unlocks new intelli uh, intellectual problems that we couldn't even think about before, but now it sort of enables us to think about uh, what intelligence even means, uh, what sort of limitations can we identify, and even how to do that. And um, uh, yeah, just uh, overall really exciting time. So you're talking about these models allow us to start thinking about what intelligence really means. And I want to dive into that with you shortly. But before that, models trained on the entire, not entire, but a large swath of the internet. What does that even mean? What does it mean to train a model on a lot of data from the internet? Yeah, so um, uh, the quest for, in some sense, this is the quest for the limit of the scale. Uh, so what I really appreciate about, you know, uh, OpenAI and some others did is to see what happens if you train a very large model on uh, uh, the vast amount of data available on the internet. And it turns out uh, it can pick up on 
uh, patterns that we thought would be impossible for uh, language models to pick up on. And although the learning objective boils down to something as simple as predicting which word comes next, uh, the representation that is learned by these models are so powerful so that it can then be um, uh, massaged a little bit so that it can be used for a variety of different uh, downstream language problems or downstream NLP applications. Now, the most popular application in most people's minds is probably chat GPT, where the application is literally you, you chat with a model that somehow is a neural network that has read most of the internet. Um, and based on that, gives you responses, right? Um, who would have thought that training on so much of the internet would actually lead to meaningful um, responses? Because a lot of people put garbage on the internet and somehow this model uh, sifts through all of it, internalizes some things and, and, and has a meaningful conversation most of the time, it seems. Yeah, so yes and no in the following sense. If you just to do the internet data training, then usually the model doesn't do the amazing things that ChatGPT can do. So the magic comes from what happens afterwards. So after this quote unquote pre-training, uh, which is about training this neural network on a lot of raw internet data, what happens is that there's a bit of, um, well, I shouldn't say a bit of, there's a lot of uh, extra training in the form of uh, fine tuning, quote unquote, uh, fine tuning, which is basically supervised to train on some human demonstration of a question answering. Um, so, you know, speculation is that uh, such data, without such data, um, RLHF, so reinforcement learning with human feedback alone is not going to be as successful because the exploration of reinforcement learning might not be able to discover the stereotypical lawyer like language that ChatGPT uh, currently spits out. You know, that's not the normal language that internet uh, web data necessarily is trained on. And so it really helps a lot when, you know, like any other reinforcement learning cases, when you do the uh, demonstration-based uh, or behavior cloning or uh, demonstration-based Im imitation learning at the beginning and then start to reinforcement learning, then uh, it can learn much faster. So likewise, there's that going on. Plus, a lot of this uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback so that it can actually um, generate uh, like responses that are a little bit safer to consume and a little bit uh, socially more pleasant and uh, proper to consume for end users. But, you know, this is all sort of what happens after pre-training. Recently, John Schulman gave, gave a talk about the chat GPT system and the way he presented it, and I'm curious about, about your take on this and if that framing makes sense to you. His take was you train on the entire internet, the pre-training, um, and the purpose of that is for the model to essentially know everything that's out there, but now it has no clue what actually matters. And then the fine tuning tells it not any new knowledge, but just of everything that you already know use these things when you have a conversation. Does that resonate with you? Does it seem different to you? I, I think it's a really good uh, um, uh, framing of what's happening through reinforcement learning. Um, um, another way to maybe say the same thing, but slightly from a different angle might be that essentially the learning objective was not quite right to begin with in some sense because uh, human learning is really never about predicting which word comes next. We really abstract away what's important and try to make sense of it. And in doing so, we are also able to ignore uh, information that's likely not to be trusted, like, you know, um, uh, conspiracy theory, for example. You know, if you read it, you're not going to suddenly believe it. You are going to think about it. And similarly, when you read the papers on archive, you don't necessarily trust everything we, you read. So, uh, humans do have the capability of reflecting on what they read and then uh, build the true knowledge model about uh, scientific facts as well as how the world works. Whereas currently, the pre-training learning objective is not really encouraging neural network to learn uh, the knowledge 
in a corrective form. So then we have to sort of like massage the model a little bit or calibrate it into the right direction. And that's what reinforcement learning currently is able to handle. That's so interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. And it seems to open up very exciting research directions because it seems like a big open question. Then how do you, how do you reformulate the pre-training um, such that it's truth-seeking, um, looking for correctness, deciding what might be good to retain as a true fact versus what is just stuff people put out. But, you know, that's all there is to it. It's stuff that some people like to put out on the internet. Um, any progress on that front? Um, I would just say not very much, but it's just something that I think a lot about. And especially when I think about common sense challenges, uh, it's a, it does share similar challenges compared to encyclopedic, encyclopedic knowledge about the world. So the, the, the knowledge generally have uh, sort of a two flavors. One is just knowing, you know, which actor was born in what year, you know, which I never remember. I have to Google search or Bing search to find out. But um, and then there's just like general generic knowledge that you know about how the world works. So, for example, you know, when you. Uh, record, you need a good microphone and you want to keep the room quiet. So this is our common sense knowledge about, you know, recording, for example. And, you know, even if it's not written somewhere out loud, we kind of figure out a vast amount of such knowledge. Um, and so in some sense, I, I love the challenge of being able to abstract away this unspoken common sense knowledge about how the world works based on just the raw internet data or, you know, YouTube videos that we can find on, on the web and ha have an algorithm that can try to uh, distill the hidden implicit knowledge and then make it more explicit so that humans can inspect. Now, that's the, the next frontier. Um, one of the things I really love, and we'll get back to that next frontier, but one of the things I really love about your talk, Siajin, is that you have a superpower in um, some sense dissecting what these current models cannot do yet, right? You'll have these beautiful examples where you know, somehow GPT-4, the latest model, even that model, much larger than the previous ones, still makes mistakes that maybe even a three-year-old wouldn't make. Um, so it's a big contrast with, oh, GPT-4 can do 80% of our work, yet it makes mistakes that three-year-olds wouldn't make. Are there any examples that currently are, you know, top of your mind that are great, great examples that you can share where GPT-4 would still fail despite all its amazing other capabilities? Yeah, one of the funny examples that I used in my recent TED talk was... Uh, Suppose you're going to dry five clothes in the sun and it took them five hours to dry out completely. So five clothes took five hours to dry out in the sun completely. How long would it take if I want to dry more clothes together, like 30 clothes together? GPT-4 said 30 hours. Um, there, there are quite a few, actually. Um, I had um, a lot more examples, but a lot of them quite didn't fit into the, you know, TED talk style presentation in which examples should be pretty uh, simple. Um, but um, yeah, th though I, I should um, note that finding these examples is a bit random in the sense that, you know, in the past, when I worked with the GPT-3, I had a pretty good intuition where it's going to fail. Whereas these days with the GPT-4, I actually don't know. It's very random why it fails, why it doesn't. So even you, you have to spend a good amount of time to, to find those failure cases. Yep. Well, I, I, I really appreciate you, you spending the time because it's really, I think, you know, the best way to do research to understand what to even try to work on next is to really understand what's not solved yet. Now, a lot of people might argue, sure, it doesn't know that 30 clothing items then also take five hours because you can, you know, hang them all next to each other. You don't need to, you know, do them after each other. Um, a lot of people m might say that kind of answer, just wait for GPT-5, right? Um, train on yet more internet data, maybe yet a bit more or a lot more human feedback in the training process, but essentially the same procedure at larger scale. That is in some sense the 
thing most people expect at least to be done and then expect to be even better, right? What do you think about that? How far is that going to get us? Is there a limit to how far that can get us? Who knows? I mean, honestly, who knows? But, you know, I'm speculating that we don't know the depth of common sense. Um, it might be really, really deep. And the thing is, humans do not need additional training to answer any of these trick questions that give hard time to GPT-4. So doesn't this really like uh, trigger your curiosity that there might be an alternative solution to the intelligence other than putting more RLHF and putting more data into the training soup? So, I mean, I personally, it's like this. I believe that the more you do RLHF with these failure examples, uh, the better performance you will get. You will be able to cover more and more corners of these error cases that internet people find out. Um, but the question is, how do you know for sure that you covered everything? We will never know. In fact, there will always be, I speculate that there, there are some other corners that, you know, uh, people haven't found out. So GPT-4 fails at. Um, but even if that does solve it, do we like the solution in the first place? Because this RLHF data is not open. So only one company currently owns it. And so that means any other people developing, you know, pre-trained neural language models have to reconstruct the whole thing to cover all the corner cases in such a brute force way. And do we like that solution? I mean, you know, one thing that I personally believe this, believe is that whenever there's a solution, there are, it's a proof of existence of a solution or I should say solutions in plural, because it's likely that there's another solution that's potentially even better. And it's likely that the first solution is not the optimal one. I like that. And we've definitely seen that play out historically in, in research. Once one group puts out a paper achieving something, even if not all the details are, are there, often Another group matches it, outperforms it, and it's in many ways how research progress gets made. But there's a little bit of a kink here right now because, as what you said, not all the data is available to others, so that's expensive. And the amount of compute used for the current approach to the current most capable AI is so large, very few organizations have to compute, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, but maybe your hope is that there's a solution that requires less compute. What do you think? Yeah, so, um, you know, one thing I really appreciate that OpenAI did was demonstrating that something like that is possible at all. This is super exciting because um, that really increased my belief that, oh, there's a better solution using less compute, smaller models. There gotta be one. We just need to find out. But it's really important that people actually try different ideas as opposed to trying to do the same thing, uh, scaling things up. And I worry a little bit that a lot of companies now try to do the same thing. And then in the meanwhile, yeah. professors in academia or students in academia feel a little bit um, hopeless in this uh, large model uh, uh, like a scale game because they feel like they don't have the resources to be able to make an impact other than writing yet another prompt engineering paper, which is really sad. I think definitely there is a lot of people wondering in academia how, how to compete with the current industry efforts, especially in the natural language processing space, because that's a space that's been and sometimes most affected um, and, and that the capabilities have shot up so dramatically by training large models there. So what what is your take? I mean, are you going to go to industry to train larger models? Do you think there are things to do in academia that are even more exciting? I don't know. Like, I'm always a little bit like, I want to try something that is different. Probably I will fail, but I'd rather try than going with the, you know, trendy uh, bandwagon. So, I mean, I do have some recipes that I tend to resort to, to that have been pretty um, uh, fruitful in pursuing, you know, alternatives that can actually 
uh, improve the performance of the smaller models. And of course, you know, these are sort of like academic papers. So it's not the case that suddenly through one of these, I can create ChatGPT that can compete with the ChatGPT right away. But uh, so there, roughly speaking, two things that I found super fruitful. One is inference time algorithms. You know, like I, I was drawn to uh, computer science in the first place because of algorithms and, you know, AI used to be heavy on algorithms and now it's just sort of like gone out the window, uh, thanks to the, you know, emphasis on the scale. But I found that, um, inference time algorithms can really bring out the hidden potentials of neural language models, uh, without only resorting to the scale, when you resort to, to inference time algorithms, you can certainly boost the performance dramatically. And sometimes even without having to do supervised training on your target task. And I wouldn't say this is always true for every single task, but for a, a variety of tasks, we found that this works well, so well so that we had a paper called the Neurologic a that uh, won a Best Paper Award at Knuckle. Recently, um, so that's, that's one, uh, fruitful direction, inference time algorithms. Nice thing about this, by the way, is that it feels intellectually more pleasing for students to work on algorithms. They never need to do hyperparameter tuning that's potentially boring and, um, you know, uh, just lots of hyperparameter tuning. So they don't need to do that. And so long as they implemented the algorithm correctly, it does tend to work right away. And then it tends to work on different task formulations as well. So we found that it's generally quite exciting. Before you go to the next one, you said inference time algorithms. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? What does that mean? I'm, I'm, I don't work in the NLP space that directly myself, so I actually don't know what to imagine. I'm thinking, you know, beam search or improvements to beam search where you generate multiple samples in parallel and select the best one. But is, is that the right thing to think about or is it something yeah. else? Yeah, so uh, beam search or... Uh, you know, beam search used to be the de facto standard for a lot of NLP applications. And then sometimes people did uh, sort of like greedy decoding. So those are two were used quite often. And then, um, uh, okay, let me uh, backpedal a little bit and then first to talk about sampling algorithms as well. Uh, because we had this paper uh, titled as the curious case of a neural text degeneration in 2019. So this is right after GPT-2. And we noticed that GPT-2, you know, the unicorn text that uh, caused a lot of attention back then, was not based on beam search. It was based on sampling. It was based on what they called as top K sampling. And that triggered uh, our curiosity quite a bit because why do you sample? Why not find the argumex? Like, why not use a beam search to find a better text? Um, so we investigated that and we found that if you try to look for argmax, you know, the, the best probability sequence out of your neural language models, so then you get degenerate text. So broken so that it's very funny, you know, like whenever this sort of um, text comes out, we start laughing so much because you cannot believe. And initially I thought this gotta be a bug in your code. But then it turns out this is the true behavior of neural language models assigning extremely high probability score for such a broken text that's so unnatural. It was probably never in the training data, but the learned language model does have this, this sort of like a degenerate behavior hidden. So the paper provides why that's the case, etc. Uh, it triggered a lot of follow-up research, but one particular solution we proposed back then was top P sampling. So uh, basically the idea is that when you look at the probability landscape uh, for predicting which word comes next, it's almost as if you're looking at an atom and the nucleus inside of an atom. So nucleus is tiny, but it's... Um, uh, uh, um, it, it is occupying the the vast majority of the mass, probability mass. So it's a tiny little uh, for, pro, uh, proportion. So in some sense, it's a like small working vocabulary that's eating up all your probability mass. And if you sample out of it, 
then you get amazing text suddenly. Like the, the quality improvement is quite mind blowing how much of this actually matters. So this is when I started tasting this, you know, uh, the, the joy of just like modifying the decoding time algorithm out of the neural network. And then you get vastly different performance. So I had a variety of, uh, such papers in which, um, I tried to modify the probability, um, uh, distribution a little bit, but more recently, uh, we looked at this, what we called as a neurologic decoding, where basically the idea is that if you give me any logical constraints, for which word to include or not include uh, specified in logical forms, uh, more concretely conjunctive normal form, but you know, that's a technical detail. Um, then we can write a uh, sophisticated beam search uh, that can try to satisfy all your constraints uh, while producing fluent English text. And turns out a lot of NLP applications kind of need something like this. You know, sometimes you want to generate some output text and want to incorporate some keywords or want to incorporate or, or avoid some other keywords that you don't want to incorporate, then you can specify this. And even for machine translation, sometimes there can be grammar inflection rules that you want to incorporate as logical, uh, logical uh, rules. So we've done of a lot of application scenarios, even including machine translation, and we could demonstrate that you know, across the board, you can improve the performance right away. And in some cases, even using neurologic decoding on top of unsupervised off-the-shelf GPT-2 can do better than your supervised model uh, based on beam search. And then so much so that sometimes a smaller network can do better than larger network. You know, this is really unexpected empirical result, but like neurologic on top of a smaller unsupervised model can do better than the beam search applied to larger network supervised. So depending on the target task. That's really interesting. Th thanks for elaborating on, on the inference time um, algorithms. You said there was a second direction that you're very excited about. What's that? Data. So AI models are as good as the data that it's feed, fed on. And so um, you know, one way to enhance the data is just quantity, just add more or, uh, hire people to write you demonstration data and then more thumbs up, thumbs down for RLHF. So these are more straightforward methods that the community, uh, relies on. But I do think that there's so much more that we can explore there as well. So. Um, some of our research is sort of um, investigating AI-generated data. Um, and usually AI-generated data is not very good, but for, for example, uh, common sense knowledge distillation or even for uh, entirely different tasks such as a summarization task, uh, we explored AI-generated data that goes through a collection of different AI, basically over-generating and then crit criticizing another AI's generation so that it's almost like reinforcement learning exploration combined with uh, reward the network filtering out some of the bad explorations. So it has a uh, RL interpretation to it. So, But anyhow, uh, we found that if you actually explore really good data, then... Uh, and Quality is more important than quality if you, quantity, if you do it correctly. And we found that there are multiple papers of this nature, but we found that you can uh, enhance the performance of a smaller model to match or win over GPT-3 DaVinci, the instruct version of GPT-3 DaVinci uh, performance for some of these wow. application scenarios. That's amazing. One of the things that keeps coming back in our conversation here is common sense. Uh, you keep alluding to that concept. What do you mean when you say common sense and is it still missing from these current models? Yeah, so um, I define common sense as general knowledge about how the world works that most people share. The keyword here is most people. So, you know, common sense is not universal knowledge. Um, and it's about diverse 
like a spectrum of things, including social common sense knowledge, physical common sense knowledge, and all of the above. Um, the larger models do have more of it. It does have a really impressive amount of it. So that's really exciting because we might be able to finally give a major crack at it. Uh, what's quite curious though is that it randomly fails at some of these simpler cases. So, uh, it's both exciting, uh, for its performance, but it's also really curious. Why does it fail at such easy cases that children would be able to answer correctly? So, um, yeah, it's um, it's a topic that has been in my mind for a long time, uh, but I started working on it primarily, let's just say, 2017 or 18, and back then it seemed like a more relatively like a crazy idea to pursue. You know, these days I think people got used to, to hearing this word on and on and on. So you know, some people actually work on it as a major research direction for themselves as well. But, you know, when I began, it was sort of like uh, considered as the word not to be spoken because it sounds like, you know, you, one might be crazy by saying so. Too ambitious. Is that the way to put it? It was considered too ambitious at the time? Yeah, maybe it came across as too ambitious and, um, you know, so much so that when writing a paper, sometimes my co-authors told me not to use the word common sense just don't use the word at all because it triggers the wrong, you know, emotional reaction from people, they said. And um, so I was avoiding even saying the word for some time. But then here's one realization I had. The, the reason why I started working on it is because I realized that the reason why people thought it's too ambitious is based on the failures in 70s and 80s. And how do we know that they tried everything in 70s and 80s when... They didn't have a neural network. They didn't have a crowdsourcing. They didn't have the same kinds of algorithms or uh, learning uh, algorithms or inference algorithms developed. But above and beyond, one problem that I saw was the fact that all the research in 70s and 80s were based on logical forms. You know, my first reaction to that was that we, we got to get rid of all of that. Well, you've definitely started making a lot of progress in this direction and and I think also more and more people are currently excited to work on the topic of common sense seeing it as one of the key missing pieces to have you know real general common sense in, in these models which is, is clearly still lacking in a general way um, but related to what you just said Yashe have also claimed that language is the best medium for reasoning and it seems there are alternatives out there that were invented to be good for reasoning, like mathematical formal uh, proof languages, right? Or logical or probabilistic reasoning systems, which are designed by humans to be good for reasoning. And yet you are saying, actually, we should just reason directly in language. Why? <laughs> yeah, so um, this is, um, I don't know why I'm attracted to this thought, but I am. And it's a difficult position to hold, but here's my uh, reasoning about that. Uh, so the problem with mathematical equations is that they're beautiful, they're correct, uh, but they're too narrow in the expression, the expressive power that they have. This is a problem for both equations and logical forms compared to the amount of information that humans can actually acquire and then communicate, and then reason about, and so forth. So when I just think about the scope of information, I worry that logical forms or equations are amazing human invention for communicating certain kinds of reasoning. So it's a powerful vehicle for reasoning as well, but it does not encompass everything. And especially if I wanted to make a dent at common sense, I felt that uh, language might be really important, uh, especially if we want to cover human-like common sense, not like, you know, a cat or dog level common sense, but if we want to target human-like common sense, then my speculation was that language is important. Having said all of this, you know, I was kind of curious what actual mathematicians or theoreticians might think about 
my claim that, you know, probably will get bashed by them. I thought about at least one person, David McAllister, he agreed that as a theoretician, uh, he cannot think without language. In fact, if you look at any theory papers, it's uh, all covered in natural language. There's no such a thing where you can only reason through and, you know, describe everything through equations or logics, logical forms. So language is a really important aspect of reasoning, even for math, confirmed by a theoretician. Well, I love that observation also that when you look at the papers, there's definitely a lot of language in there, at least for other humans to be able to consume it more easily that way, right? Um, it's very hard to consume a paper that's just equations. In fact, I don't know if it's it's all that feasible at all. Now, here's maybe an even a taller order than common sense. And you've, you've been thinking about it. Uh, what's your current thinking? Can a machine learn morality? <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm quite excited about this um, for different reasons. But one reason being um, AI safety. Um, I wonder whether it's even possible for AI to be truly safe to humans without really learning norms and values. And that includes moral norms as well, whether we like it or not. Um, and uh, the, the boundary between moral norms or social norms or cultural norms or uh, all of these are uh, rather blurry in the sense that these are distinct concepts that share boundaries. Um, but anyway, can machine learn that? Who knows? It's not clear if humans learn that all that well either. So can machine do even better than humans? Uh, I don't know about that. But what's intriguing about me, though, is that it does share a lot of commonalities when I compare the challenges with the common sense in the sense that there are usually rules, common sense rules, basic common sense rules, like, like birds can generally fly. And then there's this endless list of exceptions. So, you know, birds cannot fly if they're sleeping. Birds cannot fly if they're dead. Birds cannot fly if they're newborn. And then birds cannot fly if they're in the cage. And when it comes to moral norms, what's fascinating to me is that in general, you and I agree that, uh, you know, we shouldn't steal. But, you know, what if you are uh, in the street and you see somebody majorly injured and, uh, you know, bleeding profusely. And then there's just like a pharmacy right there. And then you want to buy bandage for this person, but the line is so long. Do you wait in the line or do you first uh, do something about the situation and then pay them later? Um, maybe this may come across as a made-up example and we sh still shouldn't steal. But the other aspect of social norm is that they're more like um, uh, rules that are not as um, as um, uh, wildly. I mean, like, okay, here's one rule example. This is um, work by Sydney Levin, and I think she had a bunch of co-authors whose name I cannot enumerate. But Sydney Levin, uh, she majored in moral cognition, moral psychology, and she studied when people bend rules like. Uh, not cutting lines when you wait in line, you know. Usually the etiquette is that, you know, you, you should go to the back of the line, right? But then, you know, what if it's a line for a bathroom and someone has a medical condition? Maybe it's okay to cut the line. What if, you know, it's a line for medication and somebody has a major headache and, or line for water, somebody's feeling really sick and probably it's okay for them to cut the line. And there's so many cases in which rules can be bent. And, you know, whether you think it's okay to bend the rule or not has a lot to do with your values, like your values, my values. The beauty of this is that uh, humans have different values. So somehow we need to incorporate value pluralism, and all around this is, this comes across as a computational problem, but such a messy one. And I found that really um, quite uh, exciting to think about. It's a, it's a difficult problem for sure. And, and really important. I love the examples you're giving because I think it's, um, it really gets to the, to the hard part. Um, it's 
learning just the basic rules, sure, a language model should be able to memorize the basic rules. But then understanding the, the nuances of when it might be okay to, to bend those rules or when, you know, at least many people might consider it okay, that, that gets very, very nuanced very, very quickly. Um, and definitely internet text won't, won't get it right on its own, I imagine. Oh, yeah, nope. Now, everybody talks about larger, ever larger models. Um, are there ever benefits to having smaller models? Is there, you know, I mean, you, human brains have a certain size and maybe biology constrained us of how large our brains can be. But w- what do you think? Is, is, are we, as humans do, might we have the optimal size and going larger than that is not going to help anymore or going larger and larger will end up superhuman? Yeah, um, in general, I'll probably agree that larger is better. Um, with everything else, you know, equal, probably larger is better. But it might be that, you know, if everything is not equal, uh, meaning, you know, either you have a choice to make, either you make the model larger or you spend more compute for inference time algorithms or making better data, then uh, it might be that there's a smaller model that can do as well as a larger model. And in any case, my speculation is that there's a scale Goldilocks zone such that too little is not good, too large may not be necessary either. There's just the right amount of data to be able to achieve amazing intelligence. One of the things that when I was taking uh, NLP classes in my PhD days, almost 20 years ago at this point, um, people would talk about, you know, syntax, grammar, and some of the core things that people were studying in NLP was, can this algorithm that I just designed, which maybe has some learning sprinkled into it also, parse a sentence into the subject and the verb and what's a noun phrase versus a verb phrase. And that was, it seemed almost like the pinnacle of NLP efforts at the time. And I hear seemingly nothing about it these days. Oh, you know, how, how could it be so important back then and, and, and just people don't care now? Is it going to make a comeback or is this, was that kind of a sidetrack at the time? Yeah. Um, when I was a PhD student, the parsing was uh, one of the largest tracks uh, at a conference, NLP conferences. So certainly the, the change uh, is really quite something because these days hardly nobody does parsing. But, and also I was never that excited about parsing, by the way. So <laughs> I was very happy to see that uh, not being the center of the NLP field anymore. And here's the reason why I used to think that way meaning I'm going to flip what I used to think, but I used to think that way because I felt that the parsing um, focused on too much on some of the basic information of the sentence structure, ignoring what uh, linguists will uh, describe as more pragmatic meaning. So there's the syntax, there's the semantics, and then there's the pragmatics. And the pragmatics is a lot about reasoning about what's not spoken. You know, for example, when you read a recipe, when the recipe says bake for half hour, it may not tell you bake where, but you know bake where. Of course, bake in the oven, you know, where else? And then even if bake what, you know, bake what is not said, well, probably there's this dough or whatever else you're preparing in the recipe. So it's okay for you to drop these arguments of an action, arguments of a function, uh, can be easily dropped in actual human language, which traditional parsing completely ignored. Or, you know, maybe I should uh, step back a little bit and say that some people worried about these uh, dropped arguments, you know, fancy uh, terminology for this is ellipsis. But a lot of people in practice didn't really work on it. And in any case, there was not enough of a tr- uh, supervised uh, data to train on any model. So uh, I just was a, a bit unhappy about the fact that it's so narrowly scoped for a long time. But now that um, neural networks are so good at understanding a lot of aspects of a language, I wonder 
if now could be really the time to revisit parsing, but for the first time, really attack all these difficult aspects of a pragmatic understanding that previous efforts couldn't really handle because for those cases, human annotated data was unbelievably expensive and it was impossible to gather. But I wonder whether it's possible to algorithmically induce such data or annotations um, mixed with human verification. And if that's possible, this is all very speculative. If that's possible, it might also help enabling smaller model that can understand language or text in general better. But this is like speculation built on top of another speculation. But um, um, in general, I think it's good to try things that are different from the mainstream. So who knows? Yeah, I love it. Speculation on top of speculation, um, deviating from the mainstream, best way to, to have a surprising result, but also, I guess, often best way to, to have no results at all. Um, oh, it, yeah. It's risky to go down yeah, those yeah, yeah. paths. <laughs> um, now, switching gears from, from the more fundamental research to the application space, wh when you look at what's happening with these language models, such fundamental progress being made, are there some real-world applications that really excite you personally, either already happening now or maybe that you see are likely going to happen soonish? Mm. Using language models, I'm so excited to see more multimodal applications being potentially part of the um, reality, like, you know, helping robots to plan better or navigate better, interact better with new objects that it's never seen before, um, or understanding images or videos better using language interface. Um, and then perhaps in the text domain, uh, it's very exciting to think about what new um, applications could be now built on top of these neural language models, such as education uh, assistant tools to guide the people or students through uh, tutoring service, like the sort of stuff that Khan Academy is currently working on is really very inspiring. Um, and then um, I also learned uh, from John Tashulas, he's a, a moral philosopher at Oxford, and he also specialized in jurisdiction or laws. So he mentioned something that um, there are a lot of large population of people uh, who don't have access to laws or service uh, for laws because they just don't have uh, the financial means. But even if they were to use a, a bit of a public service, their line may be too long. So there are a lot of the times they just, you know, have no, no way to uh, complain legally about anything. And Somehow being able to serve those populations seems to be amazing. And then recently I met um, someone who's uh, Eisenhower Fellowship winner, um, among those Eisenhower Fellowship winners. Uh, I'm so sorry that I'm blanking on his name, but he told me about, so he's from Nigeria, and he told me about how um, in Africa there could be some populations who cannot really go see a doctor but really could benefit from the phone uh, interface that gives them some basic advice about their current situation with their sick child, for example. So I felt that, wow, there's uh, potentially really a lot of uh, positive use cases yet to be uh, developed. That's really exciting. Now, if you think about some of those use cases, it probably needs more research too, because if I think about things like the medical use case, I mean... We can't fully trust the responses of these models at this point. It might be better than no response at all, but maybe not. I mean, maybe it's better to hold off on taking action than to take a misguided action. So it seems a bit of a ways to go. But do you th do you think otherwise? Yeah, uh, I'm so glad that you uh, follow up on that. Um, so there's a major risk, uh, especially if some doctors start relying on ChatGPT, because it does impress. Uh, it does do well on diagnosis on a lot of cases, so then doctors start relying on it. And then suddenly there's this oversight 
that can cause a big problem. But this is not just a problem at the level of doctors' reliance on GPT, ChatGPT, or GPT-4. This is actually a real problem for citizens as well, because they might just self-diagnose using ChatGPT and then not see a doctor because that seems like good enough. So um, I think this deployment is quite complicated and nuanced depending on what population we target on what purpose. And in any case, we kind of need to um, increase the level of AI literacy in the broader community so that they realize that this is not something to be fully trusted yet. And finding the flaws might become harder and harder, which means people will rely on it even more and more. And so one of the critical research direction in my mind is some sort of a systematic discovery of where the flaws are, where the limitations are. Um, but um, it's open research question right now. Well, m- maybe not anymore a few years from now, depending on, on your progress and, and others um, maybe listening in. Um, Hyejin, we talked a lot about AI, NLP, research and so forth. Um, but let, let's go much further back for a moment. Where did you grow up? What kept you busy as a little kid? And how did you end up in AI? Yeah, so it's a long story. So I'm from South Korea. Uh, growing up, I think I I knew early on that I was drawn to STEM fields and I loved uh, playing with things that I can build or construct or uh, deconstruct, like, you know, assemble things and deassemble things. And whenever some electronic uh, devices get delivered in the house, I would be so happy to, you know, see if I can assemble it, if there's assembly needed. Um, so I, I knew that I was really drawn to science and math. I, I loved that and hated English, by the way. So my English was really bad. Um, now, now, now I had to catch up on it so I can get by and do my job in the U.S., but <laughs> this is back in Korea. Um, but... Um, I didn't know about this computer science as a field. Um, so when I uh, was about the time to decide, you know, where to apply for college, I decided I'm going to do maybe computer engineering. You know, I never knew much about computer or didn't know much about programming, but sounded cool only because it sounded cool. I applied to it. So uh, during this computer engineering degree, though, Mostly I was designing CPUs and, you know, uh, circuit design and uh, programming for circuit design, not uh, the kind of programming you need to do for AI and also never took AI class either. Um, so, uh, and, you know, I, I never knew that I could eventually go to grad school uh, because, uh, you know, I was growing up in this culture where I got the impression that I studied a bit too much by going to this particular university in Korea. So I was getting a bit of a discouragement from, you know, left and right that this is too much. And they used to have this joke that, you know, I'm neither woman nor man by doing this major. And, you know, it's a third gender. And so um, I assumed for one reason or the other, I studied too much or my parents cannot afford it and both. So I have to find a job. And for finding a job, I kind of noticed that there's something called software engineering as a job. And for that, I started studying programming on my own as a side hobby because the classes didn't teach it uh, in the major that I was doing. Um, And then it so happens that Microsoft uh, ran out of engineers within U.S. because of this uh, dot-com bubble in 2000 or, you know, slightly before then. So it so happens that only for one year, they were going to hire from random countries outside the U.S., such as Korea. Um, except I couldn't speak in English, so I couldn't really apply for four <laughs> months. I was studying so hard English so that I might have actually have a chance to do the interview. So I did the interview with a very basic English skill set, but, you know, at least coding, I was okay. So I passed the coding interviews. So I, I started my career as a software engineer uh, in Seattle. 
uh, working for Microsoft. And um, still, I had no clue that I would eventually do AI. And if anything, back in Korea, AI was considered to be winter time. Um, and um, uh, I was doing more like, you know, high performance server uh, uh, programming. Uh, and so that was my specialty. And it was so fun for me to do that at Microsoft. But after two years, I started becoming very restless because I started owning a lot of code. And um, uh, I wasn't sure if I can do this for the rest of my life. So sort of like learning phase, kind of like plateaued. And then um, I could get away working less and less, but I needed a bit of a different uh, adventure. And that's when I decided, oh, maybe I can do, um, I can do PhD. But of course, you know, uh, people around me talked down, tried to talk me out of it. It was like such a bad idea. And especially AI, are you kidding me? Like, did you know that AI is a winter time? You know, so... Um, I didn't expect too much out of my PhD. I just, uh, I just wanted, it was really important for me to have that period of time when I can explore AI for some mysterious reason that I couldn't explain, but I had to. And I, then I was going to be ready to return to the same job as a software engineer after that few years of period. But that didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you didn't go back. What, 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 what made you? not go back. Oh, 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 yeah. And then what happened was that, um, whoa, AI was so hard. So during my PhD, I decided to do NLP, especially because that seemed like such an, such a field that seemed to be even less developed than anything else in AI vicinity. Uh, otherwise I was considering to do logic as uh, AI logic. I'm glad that I didn't do that, by the way. <laughs> like, I'm glad that I did NLP, but, you know, like NLP, that was like, you know, textbook version one came out and uh, from zero to one, it was exciting time. You know, Dan Jarofsky's uh, first textbook and, you know, I'm looking at it and there's a typo and I was thinking, hmm, you know, I can correct a typo then maybe this is a good field for me to have some chance to do something at all as opposed to something to way to develop. So... Uh, but but about the time I was graduating, hap, uh, sub, subprime mortgage crisis happened. So there was no job. So I couldn't graduate mm -hmm. right away when I was ready. And I had to wait. Uh, and then when I was finally graduating, there was basically I had like uh, one interview and one offer at university. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, postdoc offer. Uh, and... Between the two, I figured, oh, maybe I'll try this uh, professor job at Stony Brook. So that's how it began. And still, it was not, you know, it was kind of funny time because NLP was not a hot field at all yet. So the job was really limited back then. Um, but um, I, I wanted to keep going. It was really fun. I just didn't want to go back. I, I, this was too fun for me. So, well. Wow. Hat tip to uh, Stony Brook for identifying your your uh, your vision and expertise. I mean, if they hadn't hired you at the time, who knows? Maybe we we'd be missing out on, on you in the field. So uh, <laughs> thankful to them. Um, of course, the rest is history. Now, now, now you're leading the way, um, and everybody would want to hire you. So things can change quickly. Not to mention, everybody wants to work in NLP now. So <laughs> it's a completely different world. Um, now. We've already covered a lot, but I'm hoping to ask you one more question, Hyejin, um, which is obviously you, you work a lot, but what are some things you do to get yourself away from work to really relax? What do I do? Good question. Um, I mean, to be honest, I'm having so much fun. <laughs> I, I used to, okay, uh, during PhD, I used to do a lot of other things. Like I would uh, try to bake bread and... Um, um, yeah, I, I had a, a range of hobbies. I, by the way, my bread is no good, so don't ask me to bake <laughs> anything. Uh, <laughs> but, um, these days, I, I guess I could say, um, um, uh, my partner is very much, uh, concerned about my long-term health. So he pulls me out of my, you know, computer and try to put me on a hiking trail so that, uh, I, 
I'm like departed from my computer, but of course I have my phone. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, discovered that I actually like these mountain activities these days. So I try to do that, um, on weekends that I can do, do that. But, um, otherwise, I mean, like I, there are like maybe semi work related things that also feels more relaxing, such as reading books on moral philosophy or, uh, cognitive science and, um, I found that those are just so exciting and I wish I could do more of it, but, um, I don't know. I cannot really say anything really fancy to, <laughs> as a hobby that I can brag about. Hey, going, going into the mountains sounds, sounds pretty good to me. Yejin, thanks so much for making the time. Really glad to have you on. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. This was fun. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs>